Good morning. Good morning. Well, how cool God brought us together on this street corner to be with him. It's an incredible freedom we enjoy here in this country. It's uh, an incredible, incredible privilege that we have. We're gathered in his presence. His Holy Spirit fills us up. His Holy Spirit surrounds us. And so we bring ourselves to this moment. And uh, I'm glad that you, you're a part of that. So just uh, a couple things. Uh, our, our regular ministry schedule today and on Wednesday, uh, I will say that this week our um, legacy builders have their uh, fellowship lunch Thursday at 12 o'clock. And this week, this, this go-round, um, it's bring your favorite salad. Okay. So I don't think that means everybody bring toss salad. I mean, I think that means like chicken salad, <laughs> pear salad, pasta salad, salad, taco salad. salad. Yeah. I, I will say I don't think there's going to be any fried chicken at this meal. Um, so I have to do it a little bit differently. So the, I hope those of you who are able to will be a part of that. It's good to see you today. Let's pray. Jesus, we bow in your presence. Every, every single one of us in this room and those watching online, all of us, we have things in our hearts, in our minds, um, <clears throat> some, some that are heavy, some that consume us, things that concern us. And Father, we want to, in these moments, confess those and we want to surrender them because we don't want anything to get in the way of being able to focus our hearts and minds on you. So I pray by your Holy Spirit, you would bring peace into our hearts and to our soul. Father, would you draw our attention to you in our singing, our fellowship, our praying, our Bible study. We love you today. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple and the pillars of the temple shook with the sound of his voice. There is a king in our universe. There is a ruler above all rulers. That one is God. And we are here because we have the opportunity to add our praise to to the praise of all creation, to the praise of the angels. And we say, praise my soul, the King of heaven. Would you stand, please?
theme in our songs this morning. We thinking, we're thinking of God as the king of all. We offer, offer him the majesty that is due his name. We ascribe to him the greatness that he is owed. So we continue our worship singing, How Majestic is Your Name and Great is the Lord. So when we get together to do church on a piece of land like we're doing right now, one of the, one of the cool things is when we celebrate uh, things that we see God doing and thanking him for his blessings. And um, <clears throat> we could probably stay here till dark listening to them all, but just looking around our room today, there are several that I think are worth mentioning. We have one in our midst who today is celebrating her 91st birthday. It's Miss Martha Stroop right here. Happy birthday, Miss Martha. <laughs> Seated to my right, your left, here and here, are two people who are probably smiling more than anybody else in the room today. <laughs> it's got to do with a baby, a great grand that, that was born right here, Miss Sonja and Mr. Allen. Congratulations. <laughs> Prettiest great grandbaby ever, yeah. Yeah, that's what I figured. I kind of thought that might be. Yeah, yeah, you do. You do. You're right. Wise woman there. Wise woman. And then if you look up here in our choir, and it's kind of a cool thing, we got two ladies sitting up here um, 
who, <laughs> one of the oddest things in all my years in ministry, they broke their ankles within three weeks, three weeks of each other. It's kind of a little contest who could do the worst here. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Miss Leanna and Miss Dawn right here. Isn't it good to see them back up and moving around and whatnot? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of things to celebrate. And up here to my left, you're right, uh, on the front row of the balcony is a young man named Stevie. Good to see you, man. Looking better than the last time I saw you. And we <laughs> celebrate that this morning. Bonnie, you're, you're doing a good job. God is incredible in how he works. And um, e even when we're in, in the middle of something very difficult, the faithfulness of God uh, always shows itself. He is good. We're talking about the greatness of God. I love these songs we've been singing. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 and 29, this is what God says to us about worship and about church, about the kingdom of God here on earth. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and with awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Isn't it great to worship? A God who's bigger than the biggest thing we'll ever face in life. Pray with me. Father, we bow humbly before you. Your holiness fills this room. Your greatness fills this room. We don't want to miss that. Father, you have indeed through Christ called us friends. You have called us as sons and daughters into your family. But Father, we never want to lose sight of who you are your greatness, your power, your sovereignty, your authority, your holiness, your righteousness, your justice, your wrath. So, Father, continue to call us in to your shadow here as we just surrender before you. And we thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for calling us through Christ into this unshakable kingdom in which we dwell. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There was a man named Paul. <coughs> His parents called him Saul at first. He was a faithful believer in God. <coughs> and when some people came up that called themselves of the way, he thought, that's not right. They're not worshiping God quite the right way. They're not thinking of God in the right way. So he took it upon himself with the permission of the religious leaders to go and find them and teach them the error of their ways, sometimes in some hard ways. He was on the way to the, to the city of Damascus when the founder of the way found him knocked him off of his beast, and blinded him. And he spent time blinded until another servant of the way came and helped to open his eyes. Our eyes aren't always open either. We need to remember that one of our prayers should always be to open my eyes, that I may see the wonder of the kingdom, the truth of your love, and may be able to communicate that to others. So would you continue our worship as we sing, Open My Eyes That I May See.
having our eyes opened. I think you may recognize the uh, uh, <coughs> the reference as we uh, as we see it. Uh, but would you stand together as we sing "Amazing Grace"? How sweet the sound. <laughs> Why do we love God? It may seem to be a ridiculous question, but there are motivations that people may have had through time for why they loved God. Perhaps they hoped for heaven, and so therefore they thought they had to love God. There are others who sought to avoid hell and thought they had to love God for that reason. And those are wonderful blessings for us to consider. Those are wonderful reasons for us to love God. But there is an even greater love that we can bear for him. There's a better reason. It is because he is God. What more reason do we need than that he is God and that he has loved us even at our most unlovable. Would you listen now as our choir offers our praise to my eternal King? <clears throat>
Who's familiar with Google Earth? Who's ever had any experience with Google Earth or some such thing? Okay. It's amazing. And so, you know, you can, whatever it is you're wanting to see on the Earth, uh, you locate it. And then, you know, it starts out with like a 30,000 foot view. And all you see is trees or whatever it is. And so, if you keep expanding, drawing closer, then you go from really not being able to see a lot of detail to really getting to where you see detail. And, and then, like if you're looking for your house, the next thing you know, you're looking and saying, that's my house. That's my house. Ooh, we need new shingles. But I mean, you can see your house, you know, because it's right there. From way up here, you can't see it as good, but man, you got to start somewhere, and then you dig down, and, and you get to a clearer view. That's kind of what we're doing here, starting last week, and then today, and for the next couple of three weeks, how long it takes us. We're really, we're really letting God remind us what he teaches us about his church, okay? The church that was bought and paid for by Christ. Because sometimes we forget. Sometimes we kind of take ownership of our local church as if it's actually ours to take ownership of. And so we have to be reminded of God's design in the church. So last week, we talked about the church, talked about the church was bought with the blood of Christ. I made some, some, uh, some, some big, big points. We're, we're still kind of at that 20,000-foot view of the church. Talked about that the church is priceless, but she's not fragile, okay? Talked about that the church can be wounded, but she can never be silenced. Um, we talked about how the church will, by her very nature, always be a little bit old-fashioned, because this is an old, old story that we're telling. And we don't get to change the story. It's always going to be the same story. And the more culture around the church becomes uh, unchristian, uh, the more counterculture the church has to become. Because our gospel is going to be in conflict with the culture around us. We're seeing that in America right now. I was listening to three really great theologians on a little bit of a roundtable, D.A. Carson and, um, and John Piper and uh, Tim Keller, just talking about, you know, culture and how our, the culture we find ourselves in America is really not a Christian culture anymore. And so now the church, church has really got to, to, to realize we, we're, we're going to be counterculture. If we're going to be true to the Word of God, we're going to be contrary to what's going on around us. And um, so by nature, we're always going to be a little bit old school, but we've also always got to be seeking out fresh, innovative ways to share that old, old story. And then the, the last thing we talked about last week was that the local church is not an independent franchise of the body of Christ. All churches are related. The body of Christ is made up of all those who have ever professed Jesus Christ as their Savior. Any man, woman, young person, child who has ever said, I believe Jesus, that he's the Son of God, he came wrapped in the skin of humanity at Christmas, the infant. He grew up, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, not for anything he did wrong, but for everything we've done wrong. He paid the penalty for our sin. He made a way for us to come back to God. He was buried. He was resurrected by the supernatural power of God, and I believe that. And when we uh, 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 receive Christ and believe in his name, then he gives us right uh, to be born again, to become sons and daughters of God. So the body of Christ is every believer, both living today and those who have walked before us and have already graduated into eternity and for those who will come after us. And then, within that body of Christ, there are local gatherings of the body of Christ all over the place. There's a local gathering right here on this street corner right now. There was at 8.30 a gathering in, in our small groups when there are churches all over this county who are gathering together on their pieces of land. And, and then there will be groups of, of believers who will gather together in a home or a room for a small group time. That's a gathering of the body of believers, the local church. And so, we're kind of going to talk a little bit more about the church in a big picture sense today, and then... Next week, gonna gonna really transition into more of okay, the, you and I within the body of Christ. What does that look like? What what does the Bible talk to us about that? And so these are some things I want to say to you today. I'm going to start in First Corinthians 12. If you have a Bible and you want to follow along, uh, or on your phone or whatever you use for your source of Scripture, First Corinthians chapter 12, uh, beginning at verse 12. <clears throat> and uh, these are some things that God teaches us about the body of Christ, okay? 1 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 12. We're not, we don't have time this morning to get the full context, 
Uh, I'm going to be true to the context, but if you want to go home and study these verses before and after, that would be great good stuff. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. So God's using our physical body as an example of how he's put the church together. He says, look at yourself. Man, there's a lot of different parts to you. Both the ones that we can see externally and then all this internal stuff going on that I don't even understand. And when it's all working right and when it's functioning, it's beautiful. As a matter of fact, we don't even think about a lot of the beauty of how God has designed the human body. I, I have not yet today had to tell my heart to beat. It just, it just did. God built my body in such a way that my brain and the synapses and, and all that, I mean, it just, it just worked. I have not had to remind myself to breathe. Not a single time today. I mean, there's such incredible beauty in how God has put our body together. I heard a guy one time, he was talking about this, and he said, look, look at your nose. And my first thought was, what? What, yeah. what do you mean my nose? Give it back. No, look at your nose. He said, how great is God? Think what trouble you would be in if God had put your nose on the other way with your nostrils pointing up. Every time you went out in the rain, you'd be in danger of drowning. But God didn't want that for you. He put it just right. So you can walk in the rain and get sucking wet, but you're not going to drown. This right here, a thumb. I don't get up in the morning and check my thumbs out, do you? I don't sit in front of a mirror. Do this? No, no, I do. Okay? Here's something. When you get home this afternoon, get some duct tape. Duct tape both of your thumbs to your hand. Go through the rest of the day without those thumbs. You know what you're going to wake up tomorrow thinking is the most beautiful part of your body? Your thumbs. Because you'll actually be able to pick up a, a glass without having to do this. You'll actually be able to figure out how to brush your teeth without having to do it. Our thumbs are incredible. What they allow us to do. We don't think about that until we don't have them. And God says that his body, which is the church, the body of Christ, it's a lot like the human body. It is put together. It's got a lot of parts to it. Man, it's beautiful. It's beautiful when all those parts are working. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. That's the Holy Spirit. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. Okay? So, here's the first thing. It's an amazing design. The body of Christ has the fingerprints of God all over it. Because he put it together, he invested himself by his Holy Spirit in each one of us. As I said last week, Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the provision for the church. Christ is the power of the church. Christ is the protection of the church. Christ and the glory of Christ is at the heart of who the church is. The church is one body, many parts. We're one voice, but we're also many voices. Hey, there was this thing we did when I was a little kid, which is a good while back, in church. Some of you will remember this in this room. You'll be able to do it with me, okay? So you put your hands together. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the church. Where are the people? You remember that part of it? And I always thought that that part was the bad part. Like, you know, it was like, that's not how it's supposed to be. Because here is the church, and here is the steeple. Open the church. There are the people. But as I've gotten older, I've thought, no, both of them are good. Okay? Yeah. The local body of Christ gets together all over the place. And there's ministry, and there's service, and there's worship, and there's encouragement, and there's fellowship. And, and these are the things we need, okay, to, to encourage us in our walk with Jesus. But then there's also the thought that the church is not just contained within the buildings. And that this is just as good. There's a church, there's a steeple over the church where the people, they're out here in the world. And that's kind of where we're supposed to be. We're still connected. You see that? But we're out here. Why are we out here? Because we're on mission. The design of the church is incredible. And it reminds us of the supernatural power of God at work in the church. The very fact that he says, in my church, 
You are many, but one. A lot of parts, but one. Let's look at that a little bit more in Ephesians chapter 4. You there? Ephesians chapter 4, beginning of verse 11. <clears throat> I'm reading from the uh, English Standard Version of Scripture today, by the way. Okay? Ephesians 4. And here again, uh, God's talking to us about the church and about how He's kind of designed the church and, and uh, how He's put different people into the church and why He's put them there. Um, we could go to 2 Corinthians and other places, but we, we'll go here. Ephesians 4.11, so Christ himself gave, meaning to the church, to his body, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Why? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Okay. So here's the thing about the church. The church is maturing, always. The church is always growing up. You know, I've said before to you, in terms of your personal walk with Jesus Christ, when do, when do you reach perfection? When do, you, when, when do you reach that point of maturity where you'll never mature anymore? Like when you're dead, okay? The, our whole life is a journey of growing. There's never a time when you know enough or you know everything and you're no longer going to grow spiritually. And the same is true for the church. The church is always growing. The church is always growing and maturing. And, and the whole goal of our maturing is that we look more and more like Jesus, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And God wants the church to be spiritually mature. Let's go back to the physical body for a minute, just real quick. All right. We're born really young, right? <laughs> I'm just seeing if y'all are paying attention. We're, we're born really young. We don't come out knowing how to walk, do we? We don't come out knowing how to style our hair. We don't come out knowing how to make our own oatmeal in the microwave. We don't come out knowing how to go shop for clothes. We don't... We don't come out, we don't, we come out, we don't know anything, okay? There is a growing and a learning all through our life. And so it is with Christians. We're born as infant Christians. There's always growing. So in every church, there are going to be those who are at this level of maturity because they've been walking with Jesus for this many years. But always you're going to be having people come in who are infant believers, and, and they're growing. And so there is this incredible dynamic of the development of the body of Christ, which is kind of always ongoing, and we're adjusting to it, and, and all these kind of things. I had three boys, and, you know, and they were, all, they were all really active and jumped around and made loud noises and made big messes and all that kind of stuff. But they all hit this spurt when they got to their early teenage years, where all of a sudden they grew like four inches in the summer. Do y'all remember that with your children? It's like you thought you had done good and bought uh, jeans long enough that you could roll up and they'd be able to wear them for two years before you had to buy any more. And then summer was over and they had high waters. And then they're like, Mom, I can't wear these to school. They're too short. Look at them. And, and of course, we're being good parents saying, no, that's cool, son. That's, that's the look you're going for. You know, wear them anyway. But the thing about that, when they get into that real fast growth spurt, there's a time when they just don't look really coordinated. They look like baby giraffes because they got big feet all of a sudden, and long legs, and their muscles are being stretched, and so now their coordination has changed a little bit, and we're always growing into what we're growing into, if that makes any sense. That's true for churches as well, okay? So, why do we need to always remember that we're growing into the fullness of Christ, that it is the image of Christ we're seeking after, is the glory of Christ, the reflection of Christ? Well, as we mature, verse 14, then, as we mature, we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. We need spiritual maturity so that we can stay the course, so that we can understand what it means to keep our eyes on Jesus, so that we understand what God's purpose in the church is, so that we don't get sidetracked by teaching that leads us the wrong direction. 
So verse 15, it says, speaking the truth in love, we will grow. We'll grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. And from him, from Christ, the whole body, the whole body of Christ, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. One body, many parts, all held together by the divine supernatural presence of God. Sometimes in ways we don't really understand until something happens. I'll give an example. Anybody in here ever um, blown out your knee, ACL, MCL injury? Anybody in here ever had that kind of knee injury? Yeah, okay. And so, you, you know, probably you've already walked today. Well, you had to walk at least a few steps just to get in here. I doubt in all that walking, you were thinking, I am so glad my ACL is strong today. I just, we just don't do that. I'm glad my MCL is holding my knee together. We just don't do that. The only time we really think about those tendons and ligaments holding our knee and making it stable, the only time we really give any attention to those is when? When we blow it out, when it pops, when it hurts, when we can't walk, when the doctor's talking about surgery. We're giving it all kind of attention then, okay? Um, so so even, even the parts we can't see are critical to the health and the purpose and the movement of the body. So it is with the body of Christ. And so let me say this to you, okay? The body of Christ is a miracle. The fact that, the fact that every church that's ever been formed, every local church, the fact that many of them are still going today and have not closed the doors and sold the property is a miracle. Because when you put a bunch of human beings together that have different opinions and different preferences and, 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 and all these kind of things, when you put them together, generally, they don't get along real good for a very long season. But yet, within the body of Christ, by the work of the Holy Spirit, the supernatural work, we become a miracle of sorts because God brings a whole bunch of different people together in different parts and puts us together in one body and as we grow up in him, we begin to understand what it means to have one voice, one mind, and to move in one direction because we're allowing Christ to be the head of the church. Another example, physical body, okay? If in my brain, I make the decision to walk from here over to there, okay? That decision has been made. It's passed on to my body, however that works. And what do I do? I say, walk now. And I start walking. Okay, never do I do this, I, at least not yet. Never do I say, I'm going to walk over to the choir, start walking. And my other foot not go. The head's going that way, this foot's listening. But I've never found myself where I'd say, would you, would you come on? Do you know what I want to do? I've never seen that. Why? Because the body follows the head. And the head of the church is who? The head of the body of Christ is Christ. The body of Christ is a miracle. So many voices, opinions, preferences, united into one. How? Only through the miraculous working of God. Then a body of people called the body of Christ that meets somewhere to work in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like this. Okay. This happens probably at least once a week in my relationship with my wife. Who happens not to be in here. But she heard me tell this story in the first service. I'll come home, a little bit home in the evening. Hey, what do you want to do for dinner? I don't know, let's go out. Okay. We're good so far. We both know how to get from inside to outside to our vehicle. I go around and open her door. She gets in, shut her door every time guys every time i go around and get in back out pull down to the end of the driveway hit the brakes now i'm like where you want to go eat i think jesus is going to come back and me and gail are going to be sitting at the end of the driveway <laughs> having this discussion where would you like to go eat oh it doesn't matter anywhere's fine with me i'm like oh no 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 Honey, I'm the one that'll eat anything. 
you're the picky. Oh, I can find something. I can, I can find something anywhere. Yeah, but that's not a lot of fun just going and finding something. Like, you know, what if salting crackers is the only thing there that you like, you know? So this is bang for us. So we kind of do this thing where I say, okay, okay, we're going to stay in Cochran. Okay, well, let's name the places in Cochran. And so I'll just start naming places in Cochran. Okay? McDonald's, oh no. Uh, it really doesn't matter to you? <laughs> You're quick on that, oh no. Wendy's, oh no. Hong Kong, nope, 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 nope. No Hong Kong. So I'll get it down to maybe two. I'll say, okay, here we go. We got Scott's, we got DGR's, you choose. And then I'm sitting there hoping she chooses this one and she chooses the other one. And on days when I'm not very smart, my response is, why'd you choose that one? And then she says, I thought you said it didn't matter. And then I put the truck in reverse, back up and said, let's go in here and make a banana sandwich. It'll be a lot simpler for all of us. Now, a lot of y'all have been through that whole process, you know. Okay, this is two people we're talking about, me and my wife. And it's like moving a mountain to make a decision about where to go and eat a light supper meal somewhere in this little town of Concord. It's not like there's a lot of choices out there. And we sit at the end of the driveway burning gas at $3 and something cents a gallon to make this decision. That's why I say it's a miracle if you'll stop and think about a church of two, three, four hundred people that gets together. And that's two or three or four hundred different opinions and preferences and notions and ideas and agendas and experiences and history and all those things. And yet, God gets to work in there with His Holy Spirit and, and, and draws that church to the place where it realizes the whole purpose of our being here is to build the kingdom, to grow the kingdom, to share Christ to be encouragers inside the building, to be ambassadors outside the building. And so with our focus on Christ, we begin to ask the questions, is this going to move us in that direction? Is this going to be a part of sharing Christ with our world? Is this going to strengthen us in our walk? And it's amazing how a church, I don't even care if it's a church of 50 people, can come to a place where they'll all say, you know what, yeah, let's go with it. The church is a miracle, really, a beautiful miracle of how God works, how he holds us together. How he's the glue. How many of you growing up ever heard your grandmama or your mama or your friend's mama or somebody's mama ever in exasperation in referring to their children ever heard a mama say, it's like herding cats? There are some times when I wonder if our Heavenly Father does not look down at his local churches gathered wherever they're gathered and say to himself, man, sometimes it's like herding cats to get them all moving in the same direction, focus on the same thing. Many parts, one body moving forward. Romans 15. This is the last one and we'll go. Romans 15, beginning of verse 5. May the God, may the God who gives you endurance and encouragement give you the same. May, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same. Church needs endurance and encouragement. It's not always an easy journey, especially in a world that's, that's hostile to the kingdom of God in many ways. Give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ had. This, this, this is where we see the Holy Spirit at work. The Holy Spirit giving us this heart for each other, a heart that looks like the heart Christ had for his church. You know, we're told in Scripture not to think more of yourself than you ought, but to think of others as more important than yourself. It's this whole thing of we're, we're family. We're in this together. We're the body of Christ. We're, we're the parts that he's assembled on this street corner in this little town in the middle of the state of Georgia. And, and there's purpose in that. And there's beauty in that. And there's power in that. And it's, it's, it's a miracle what God's doing right here. Have the same attitude toward each other that Christ has had. So that, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify 
the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to get that. I think one of the, one of the places where churches mess up, and when I say mess up, they get a little bit off course, is they, they, they sometimes not even meaning to, they begin to think that the whole thing is to magnify our church, and that's not it. It's always about magnifying who? Christ. Christ. With one mind, one voice, glorifying the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. There is power in one voice, especially when it's many voices united into one voice especially when that one voice is driven by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing God is doing. He bought the church at great price. He placed Christ at the head of the church. Christ is everything, everything in the church. Christ is every reason for the church. Christ is our great passion. And with our mind set on that, we begin to develop one voice, the voice of reaching our lost world, the voice of ministering to the poor and to the needy, the voice of making a difference in this brokenness of the landscape in which we live. There's power in many voices being made one. And so I want to close this way, okay? If you have a Bible or whatnot, I want you to put it down. Put it down in the pew. I'm going to close mine too. Y'all ready for this? It's going to be a quick example of the power of a many voices being one voice. You ready for this? Now, for those of you who are watching online, you may not get the full effect of this. And I'm doing this on purpose to make you want to be here on purpose instead of online. But anyway, I'm sorry, you're not going to get the full purpose. Of it. That's not really how I'm doing it. Okay, so I want you to think, don't do it. Don't, don't, but I want you to think in your, in your mind, what... What noise do I associate with a storm? Just think about it for a A rainstorm, whatever. Don't, don't, don't say it. Don't do, do it. Just, just think. Get in your head. Just get in your head. What, what, what sound? And so here's our calling as a church, just for the purpose of this illustration. Our calling is to proclaim storm to our world. So I'm going to count to three. And I want you, whatever word, sound, however it is, whatever comes to your mind when you think about a storm, at the count of three, I want us to all say that, whatever comes to our mind, okay? You good? You got that? If it's a noise, make a noise, you know? So here we go. It's one, two, three, then make the noise, not one, two, make the noise. Okay, just want to get that straight. Okay? So storm, storm. One, two, three. Okay. That was good, but one real clear. I heard some words. I also heard some sound effects. I thought I heard a <laughs> and, and some other things. I was waiting for somebody to pull their phone out, turn their flashlight on, do the lightning real quick, you know, so we could see that. What if we had one voice, one mind, one voice, in our proclamation of what a storm sounds like? So this is what we're going to do. <clears throat> Everybody's got to participate. No one is excused from this. No one. We have cameras. You're going to watch me. I know it's hard to do. I'm sorry. But I have on a pretty green shirt, so you watch me. And I move my hand across. I'm always going to start over here. And we're going to end over here. I'm going to ask you to start something. You, the rest of you, you do not start. You're, we're all going to be doing the same thing eventually. Many voices, one voice. But it's going to start here, and I'm just going to move my hand like this, and I want it to spread all the way across to the other side. Okay. And then y'all keep doing what you're doing. You keep doing it, and I'm going to come back over here. We're going to start with a different thing. And we're going to move it all the way across. Okay. Now, these are the four things I'm going to ask you to do. That's why I ask you to put stuff down. I don't want anybody to get hurt. First thing is this. Let's practice real quick. Take your hands like this. Everybody got your hands? Put them together. Easy. Second thing is this. Third thing. 
Top to your legs. Yeah. Fourth thing. Peter. Okay, now, now, while these things are going on, if at any time, instead of doing this, I do this, that means give it some energy. If I do this, pianissimo. Is that right? You're a little quieter. I, I'm trying to impress Dana. That's why I threw that word out there. Forte, pianissimo. Okay? Everybody ready? Everybody, y'all don't get to start. It's going to build coming around. What we're doing with our one voice, we are storming the world so that they recognize what's going on. Okay? This verse right here. You ready? Keep doing it, keep doing it. Both hands, unless that's beyond your capability. Feel those raindrops, feel those raindrops getting a little bit loud. Yeah. yeah. Y'all keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. Y'all follow the rainstorm. We're communicating with one voice. Sounded just like a rainstorm, didn't it? It's an incredible, incredible way to look at the power of many voices <clears throat> proclaiming the same thing the same way. May our witness in our community, in Blackwood County, as a local gathering of the body of Christ, may we proclaim with one voice, one mind, brought into focus by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's stand together. We'll pray and be dismissed. Father, thank you for our time here together today. Thank you for loving us. Father, thank you for doing for us in Jesus what we could not do for ourselves. And Father, my prayer for, for each one of us in this room, those watching online, those who were in the 830 service, Father, may we be a local gathering of the body of Christ that is truly one voice and one mind in submission to the mind of Christ and the teachings of Scripture for the glory of Christ. And it's in his strong name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. <clears throat>